hepatitis C, doing the appropriate stage evaluation, that is getting a liver biopsy, I think you can safely tell patients with no hepatic fibrosis or very minimal portal fibrosis that deferring therapy is a viable medical option. This is the halfway point of the program. Dr. Solkowski continues. Now, if that person wants to be treated, we do offer them care. I think the point is that their prognosis over the next five years, that same window for new treatments, is really quite good. The problem is, I've heard that translated to say that, well, I've got 100 patients in my practice that I see, and because the prognosis may be quite good, but you don't evaluate. So I think that kind of decision after evaluation is quite appropriate, and we probably defer therapy in as many patients as we treat. And in those patients that whom we do defer treatment, how do you follow them? Well, right now, I think there is a recommendation to follow serum ALT every six months. Now, for the most part, an ALT is a poor predictor of what's going to happen. Although there are emerging data from studies such as the ALIVE study here in Baltimore, the patient with a normal ALT will have a very good prognosis over the next three to five years. What we're telling patients is that we're going to repeat a biopsy in about four to five years after the first one to assess progression. Now, it may be that new therapy has come, and as therapy gets better, biopsy will be less important. Question for Dr. Sokoski? Yes. Well, unfortunately, patients today, typically GM type 1 infected patients who fail adequate doses of peg interferon ribavirin, there really are no effective treatments. There are a number of studies. The concepts being studied today are things like peg interferon maintenance therapy, that is, placing them on a low dose of peg interferon not 150 micrograms, but more like 50 or 90 micrograms, indefinitely try to prevent scarring. The TNF antagonist Remicade, there are studies of that agent to try to prevent fibrosis. And these patients may be eligible for new trials. For example, a lot of the new antiviral drugs, the polymerase and protease inhibitors, will be first studied in non-responders. But for many patients, unfortunately, there are no effective FDA-approved treatments. The lymphomas have been quite interesting. The ones reported in the New Madrid Medicine were splenic lymphomas. So they have not been a gastric molt, if you will. They've been low-grade splenic lymphomas or low-grade lymphomas with the high circulating abnormal lymphocytes, but not necessarily the mucus-associated ones. They're pretty rare. That's a good question. The question was screening for liver cancer or hepatocellular carcinoma, hepatoma. In hepatitis B, cancer can occur at all stages of fibrosis. Hepatitis C, cancer is limited to cirrhotic patients. So patients without cirrhosis don't require regular screening. Now the recommendations for a cirrhotic patient is every six months ultrasound and serum AFP, although there is still not conclusive data suggesting that they cost-effective strategy that needs to identify tumors early where curative options are still available. Speaking next, Bimo H. Asher, Assistant Professor of Medicine, Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, with anemia, causes, detection, and treatment decisions. When you're thinking about anemia, really there's only three types of anemia. Either you're not making enough, you're making enough, but you're destroying what you got, or you're bleeding like sick. Okay? Three types of anemia, that's what you need to know. So, the basic approach to anemia is asking three major questions. And the first is, what is the reticulocyte index? The second is, what is the MCV? And the third is, what is the peripheral smear show? Yeah, I don't know how many of you look at your peripheral smears every day on every anemic patient. I know I certainly don't. So let's start with the reticulocyte index. So everyone's familiar with the reticulocyte count. The reticulocyte index is just a manner of correcting for the degree of anemia. And so we put it into this little formula. We correct for the patient's anemia. The shift factor takes into account that reticulocytes in anemic patients will stay in the circulation longer than normal reticulocytes. 
Now you'll see a lot of different formulas for correcting the reticulocyte percentage. There's no one is better than the other. And so if you put it through this formula and your reticulocyte index is greater than two, it suggests that you have hemorrhage or hemolysis. If the reticulocyte index is less than two, it suggests decreased production or hypoproliferative anemia. Second question is what is the MCV? An MCV less than 80 femtoliters in microcytic anemia, from 80 to 100 in normocytic anemia, and more than 100 in macrocytic anemia. Keep in mind that these are very arbitrary, well not arbitrary, but they're not hard and fast cutoffs. That certainly there can be overlap between the groups, and don't forget that you can have mixed disorders. So someone who has vitamin B12 deficiency and iron deficiency, but their MCV is 90. And again, the peripheral smear will help with that. So the third thing is looking at the peripheral smear. And the first thing to do is confirm what you saw on the MCV. You may see large cells and small cells, but the MCV is normal. So you want to confirm that you're dealing with a normocytic, a macrocytic, or a microcytic process. The second thing is you want to look for specific findings on the peripheral smear. Things like hypersegmented neutrophils, macrovalocytes, spherocytes, schistocytes, sickle cells, and we'll go into some more of that. We think about four basic anemias. The first is iron deficiency, which you'll see typically a serum iron that's low, a TIBC that's high, a saturation that's low, a ferritin that's low or normal. Anemia of chronic disease, you'll see a serum iron that's low, a TIBC that's normal or low, transferrin saturation that's normal or low, and a ferritin that's normal or high. Thalassemia trait, you basically see normal iron studies. In sideroblastic anemia, you see usually high iron levels. So let's start with thalassemia. It's caused by a decreased production of alpha or beta chains. The homozygous condition is diagnosed usually in childhood, so internists rarely see a homozygous patient presenting to them. What we're going to see a lot is the heterozygous patient, the patient who has thalassemia minor, and it's common in adults of Mediterranean, African, and Asian descent. There's significant microcytosis out of proportion to what you would see with anemia of chronic disease or iron deficiency anemia. There's usually just a mild anemia. There's a high normal red blood cell count, and there's a normal RDW. All these are clues to it being a thalassemia trait. Now, what you can do is you can get the hemoglobin electrophoresis, and in beta thalassemia, you're going to see an increased hemoglobin A2 and an increased hemoglobin F. Now, let's try to explain why this happens. So in beta thalassemia, what happens? You're not making enough beta chains. So you've got all these alpha chains hanging around, and the alpha chains say to themselves, well, what can I do? Where can I go? Can I pair up with somebody? And they end up pairing up with delta and gamma. And so alpha 2, delta 2 is then your hemoglobin A2, and alpha 2, gamma 2 is your hemoglobin F. So when you do a hemoglobin electrophoresis, you're going to see slightly elevated counts of hemoglobin A2 and hemoglobin F. And that's why you see that abnormality on the electrophoresis. Now, with alpha thalassemia, if you decrease the production of alpha chains, then you've got all these beta chains hanging around saying, what can I do, what can I do? The answer is, not much. Okay, there's no other chain that they can hang out with, so they kind of form tetramers and they kind of get together. And so you usually do not see much of a change on your hemoglobin electrophoresis. In fact, you may actually see a decrease in the hemoglobin A2 level, but that's not really a very common finding. If you need to diagnose alpha thalassemia, you've really got to do molecular analysis and you can make the diagnosis. Honestly, most cases of thalassemia trait are, since they probably have had it their whole life, if you just check to see what their old hematocrits have been and follow them for a while, they probably have never changed, and so you probably don't need to work it up if you've seen this kind of pattern with the very low MCV with a very mildly decreased hematocrit. Iron deficiency, anemia, you need to search for the cause and where's the bleeding coming from. And so people would suggest doing an EGD and a colonoscopy. And really, if you look at the studies on where the money is, usually actually the money is in the EGD and not the colonoscopy. I mean, colon cancer finding for an iron deficiency patient is not as common as finding something like peptic ulcer disease, gastritis, something like that, that may 